This oral history interview is with Dr. Michael L. Mallory, uh, who was originally trained as high energy physicist at Caltech, but found his way into the uh, storage technology field and credited with numerous inventions, patents, and publications in the field over his uh, illustrious career. Dr. Mallory began his career in storage technology at uh, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, starting in 1980, where he worked for 14 years. He made many contributions there, solving highly technical problems with uh, DEC uh, products and inventing very innovative recording head designs, which are still in use today. In particular, he invented the shielded pole perpendicular writer. Uh, this is a U.S. patent 4656546 in 1987, which allowed supporting engineering developments to double aerial density. It has been predominant in the industry since 2005. After DEC, uh, was purchased by Quantum in 1994, Dr. Mallory remained with the company and made critical contribution to the acceptance of perpendicular recording in the disk drive industry through his contributions. He was a key contributor in the National Storage Industry Consortium, or INSEC, uh, effort to increase aerial density and storage using the shielded pole architecture and pushing down the grain size of the, to the limit imposed by thermal decay of the magnetization. He continued to make his contributions felt through the industry while working for Maxtor Corporation, which took over the quantum operation in Shrewsbury. After Maxtor, he has worked at Seagate and Western Digital working on advanced high density recording concepts such as heat assisted recording or hammer, micro microwave assisted recording or MAMR, and two dimensional recording or TDR. Through his 165 issue patents and 57 technical uh, publications, Dr. Mallory is considered one of the key innovators in the storage technology field. Uh, this interview will be conducted by Grant Saviors and Tami Amashita, myself. We both had the uh, privilege of working with uh, Dr. Mallory in the past, myself with uh, Mike and Insic, and later at uh, Western Digital. Uh, Grant uh, was with him at Digital Equipment Corporation. So with that, uh, I'd like to begin the uh, uh, interview process. Uh, first, by I'd uh, uh, like to ask uh, Dr. Mallory about your family background, where you were born, grew up, and received your early education. Okay, well, um, I was born in Berkeley, California, and uh, uh, my family, uh, on my father's side, lived in the Bay Area. I still have relatives there. Uh, my grandfather taught at uh, the university, sociology, and uh, he had a lot of influence on me because uh, he encouraged my uh, development in science. And uh, I, I'd say that, uh, that my interest in the world of mind uh, really had a lot of roots in his interest in, uh, in that world and uh, you know transmitted through my father and uh, and directly from him i i also uh found out recently actually uh that my grandmother on my mother's side was also very interested in uh in education uh, she was an educator and in fact uh, i just became aware that she was in a article in the boston globe in uh, 1929 uh, for having gotten uh, two degrees in, uh, from Boston University uh, in one and a half years while simultaneously raising a family of uh, five children 
uh, in Brockton, Massachusetts, and, uh, and, and they considered it newsworthy and published an article in the Boston Globe about her. Uh, anyway, she uh, uh, was also uh, very interested in education. She saw that as a way of uh, women uh, uh, getting a leg up on reality. And she was like the original feminist, really. She was outraged that, uh, that boys could get uh, sent to college and, and, and girls would not. And so she ended up going back and getting a de two degrees. Interesting. Uh, and uh, anyway, they, uh, that interest in, in uh, education and, and uh, uh, was transmitted then through my mother. And, and she, she was an interest my father because he was of an intellectual bent. And uh, he became a sculptor and, and a, he also was interested in music. He could composed and was, played the piano beautifully classical and jazz and uh, uh, I helped him with his sculpture at times I taught him welding actually <laughs> and he did some welded sculpture and at one point I actually uh, collaborated with him on the first computer sculpture uh, and it's called quad and uh, uh, a version of it has uh, been recently purchased by uh, the Tate Museum uh, that's pretty impressive yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> something in the Tate. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, and I'm I'm taking care of his art actually, uh, and I have a, a big project uh, to try to uh, preserve his art. I've been doing. He passed away 20 years ago, and I'm preserving his art. But uh, this whole thing about uh, being involved in the world of mind is uh, very much a family thing, and uh, and I uh, I got it from my grandparents and through my parents. And, uh, and that, that I think is really important. I've become more aware of it as a result of reviewing this whole, by my own biography yeah, of this right. thing. Yeah. And anyway, I grew up in uh, LA and my mother uh, was an, a, in advertising. She supported the family really. She was also one of the original feminists. Uh, she had to uh, make her way in, the, in, in a man's world and uh, uh, and she uh, was a very successful a advertising executive. Uh, in LA, uh, my father uh, worked in the garage and I was kind of underfoot and I did my little projects while he was doing his sculptures and I'd, uh, I'd carve little st statues uh, out of wood and uh, do my own woodworking projects and that gave me this hands-on experience of working with my, you know, working with my hands, building things. And, uh, and that was very important. I always liked building things. And I also uh, got into uh, reading uh, books of how things worked. And I got fascinated with uh, how various machines worked. I, when I learned how an internal combustion engine worked, that was really great, you know. And, and that, uh, but then that led to uh, an interest in how reality worked and ultimately I figured out, oh, physics was where it's at, you know, that, uh, you know, atoms and, uh, uh, well, atoms are made out of uh, neutrons and protons and electrons. Well, how do they work? And so I ended up ultimately getting into high energy physics, you know, that, uh, going down to the fundamentals of reality. Uh, you built some pretty impressive uh, things as a high school student. Uh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what were they? Tell us about them. Well, I, um, uh, I'd say the, the, the most impressive thing was uh, my science project uh, to make an electron microscope, which uh, it kind of worked. It, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, I, I did the whole thing, uh, uh, the uh, vacuum system, electron beam, uh, focusing magnets, uh, uh, I got some help from, uh, pe from people at uh, Phillips Electronics. They g gave me a uh, tungsten filament so that I could, uh, you know, build my electron gun around it. And uh, I uh, learned machining as a result. I went to the local high school. I went to, uh, I, I went to a, uh, a, a uh, Archbishop Ste Stepanak High School in White Plains, but they didn't have a machine shop there. So I went to the local high school, joined the high school uh, science uh, machine shop club and and did my machining there and learned machining to build the things I, I learned uh, to uh, 
weld. I went halvesies with my father on a welding, uh, gas welding kit, because uh, he wanted to do steel sculpture. I wanted to do my electron microscope. And uh, the first version of it uh, leaked like a sieve, so I had to learn to weld better. And, and I mean, this uh, is extraordinary. You're, this is a, you have a vacuum system. You need high voltage power supplies. Yes, uh, I phosphor screens. Uh, you know, yeah. this is well, for I, a high school kid. This is uh, yeah. Well, I bought a um, uh, for twenty five dollars. I bought an ec old X ray machine uh, to get a uh, a uh, seventy thousand volt transformer for uh, for the high voltage, but then I. Uh, I got some uh, uh, vacuum, uh, I got some rectifier tubes uh, that were, um, that I put in series. They were only 15,000 volts each, but I put a couple of them in series and immersed in oil and I ran the filaments off of uh, just uh, D cell batteries and I immersed the whole thing in oil. And, and, and then that was, and then I, I built a capacitor out of sheets of, uh, of plastic and uh, that uh, and aluminum foil and uh, and so I, I yeah I built a high voltage power supply for that you know and uh, and the uh, and then uh, how much voltage was well I, I think I was I was operating at about twenty five kV mm. and sounds uh, quite quite I, dangerous I, uh, pardon me sounds quite dangerous well. It, it, yeah, it, it, uh, you know, I, I uh, the thing is, I, I was, I, I knew about how to take care of myself because I got my first shock when I was nine years old, and I never got shocked after that. It's <laughs> anyway. a learning experience, isn't it? <laughs> you know, yeah. Anyway, I, uh, you know, I, I learned my lesson when I was nine. <laughs> now, you know, do you win any awards for this effort? Yes, I, I got an honorable mention in the Westinghouse uh, Science Talent Search. That was kind uh, of the in, uh, predecessor of the Intel one. Now I guess it is. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and that uh, and so uh, and uh, anyway, it, later on I uh, used the uh, that transformer for a uh, a science a, a, a hack that I collaborated with a friend on. He his father was a dentist. He had that transformer too. So we. We built a, uh, a a huge Jacob's ladder, which is uh, appears in all the sci uh, in all the Frankenstein movies, sure. where uh, you know when Doctor Frankenstein appears, you see a spark rising in the background. <laughs> it's called a Jacob's ladder, you know. Anyway, uh, it, uh, so you you said this is a ten thousand watt. Unit? Yeah, it was. That, that must have you know put the whole neighborhood out of business. Well, it was we were we were blowing fuses with it, yeah, and we, we built it outside so it wouldn't burn the house down, you know. And it, it had a, a gap of about this big at the top, you know. And it was anyway. Uh, <laughs> it was. This electron microscope, uh, how how far did you get? Did you did it work? Well, it it kind of worked. Uh, it uh, I got a beam going and I got a, uh, a a little bit of magnification going, but the trouble was though that. Uh, uh, at one point, uh, I, I blew out the fuse in the house. What? what let's see. What I? Let's see. What happened was. Oh yeah, I remember now. The um, I, I decided I'd, I'd I'd let it, you know, get a little better vacuum or something. And my my cooling lines coming in from the garage froze up, and so the diffusion pump didn't get any cooling. And, and then the vacuum uh, was no good. And the next time I turned on the high voltage, I got a discharge, blew out the fuses in the house, and then all the, the four pumps stopped, and the, all the oil in the four pump got sucked into the diffusion pump along with air, and then the, uh, and the, uh, the that all you know, burned in the diffusion pump and that contaminated the whole system. And I never got a decent vacuum after that. So that was, that was the end of my electron microscope. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but good, good experience for your start in experimental high energy physics, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And, and also, you know, the, I, I informed me that, you know, I really need to back up systems, you know, and, uh, you know, ways of, uh, you know, I, I should have had a uh, solenoidal uh, cutoff or a valve, or so, you know, I, I should have had some uh, safety mechanisms to uh, shut off the, uh, uh, the the vacuum, you know, the vacuum system, so that the uh, the four pump oil wouldn't get sucked into the diffusion pump. You know? well, it sounds <laughs> like you were quite resourceful getting all these parts from dentists and oh yeah, I, uh, and yeah, I, 
It, uh, uh, yeah, I, I had to go down and uh, and you know scrounge up parts from all sorts of places. I got I got the diffusion pump chimneys actually for for a dollar. Uh, I bought a couple of chimneys on Canal Street where you can get used parts. I got a, got them for a dollar each. I was walking around on Canal Street. I just saw oh. Oh, yeah, that's a diffusion pump chimney. I got, I got one of those. You know, yeah, that was great. And uh, and I built a diffusion pump around that. And uh, and I uh, I got a four pump on Canal Street in New York. Yeah, they in Canal Street in those days they they sell all sorts of uh, uh, surplus equipment right on the street. You could just go down there and buy it off the street. All gone now. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. We talked about your father. Uh, I understand that he he was actually a, a quite well known artist. Uh, I looked uh, looked it up, and he's considered a neo Dadaist. Is that the right word? Yes, yes. Uh, could you talk about him a little bit? Well, yeah, he was a, a, an interesting person, and um, uh, he uh, neo Dadaism was. Uh, Part of what he did, he became relatively famous for that. Uh, but uh, that was a, a period of time when he was um, doing uh, his tuxedo art, where uh, he would uh, uh, get buy uh, uh, used tuxedos down uh, in New York City. I don't know if that was—I don't think that was Canal Street, but it was down in uh, uh, Lower Manhattan. And he would uh, take them back to his studio in uh, in Manhattan and uh, stretch them out on uh, uh, with uh, elastic bands into gr into grotesque shapes and then freeze them in polyester plastic. And he was uh, very much into the corruption of uh, Western civilization and the fact that uh, you know that we were going down the tubes in, in a uh, cultural and moral sense. That we were really losing our uh, our our anchor, our, and uh, you know, the f you can see that very much in our modern reality. Uh, that he, uh, uh, you know, both, you know, the fact that, uh, for example, that uh, you know the world is cooking and no one cares. You know that uh, you know the uh, global warming represents an existential threat to our species and uh, people are turning a blind eye to it. You know, that's just one symptom of, uh, of the corruption of our reality. You know, just one symptom. Uh, and uh, Bob saw that in 1960. And he had a famous piece in the uh, World's Fair in New York City, I think it was 62, uh, uh, called Cliffhanger, which was, uh, you, could, you can Google Cliffhanger uh, and the uh, New York World's Fair. It was in the New York Pavilion, uh, which was a whole bunch of these tuxedo uh, figures that were hanging in various states of falling off of a, of a ladder that was horizontal. And I, I have cliffhanger at this time, and I, and I have to figure out a way of preserving it, because I, uh, I, 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 I can't throw it away. And so I've figured out that I'm going to um, purchase a bunch of uh, containers, shipping containers, and uh, pack them with Bob's art and, uh, and, and store it that way. Um. So pretty interesting uh, uh, creativity and construction projects in high school. So this leads to going off to university. And uh, tell us a little bit about how you got there, what you considered, what the alternatives were. Well, um, let's see. I, I, uh, like I said, I was interested in how physical reality works, and I wanted to get to the fundamentals of it. And f I figured out physics was it, you know. And so I, uh, um, you know, had offers from MIT and Caltech. I decided I think I'd like to go to MIT for undergraduate, and um, and I. Uh, I had uh, I, I, I I did well there, and I uh, had had a lot of fun there. I was a I got into the uh, hacking scene there in various ways. Hacking in those days was computer hacking was a, a a minor subset of hacking in general. Hacking was any kind of uh, of uh, practical joke that involved technology that would twist people's brains. And uh, it, it was supposed to be non-destructive and just something that it was supposed to create a mental, uh, 
<laughs> not in people's heads <laughs> and based on technology uh, or whatever. And uh, just, you know, uh, anyway. And so uh, one of the, uh, and, uh, and I learned physics there and uh, I learned the scientific method and the, uh, and the importance of, uh, of mathematics in terms of defining what the scientific theory is and what the predictions of the theory are and so that you can compare that to experiment. And uh, that, that whole process of, of uh, defining your theory mathematically and then comparing it to experiment mathematically. And this is one of the things that modern reality is being very, is very deficient on. It's 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 uh, it's one of my big uh, pet peeves with modern reality. Is it seems you know as we go into the future, we're becoming less numerate, not more numerate, and I, I think it's really a shame. It's uh, that uh, you know, and uh, and it's one of the reasons why we're unable to come up with uh, uh, genuine solutions to the global warming uh, situation because. Uh, most people who uh, are trying to deal with a problem will not deal with the numbers of it. It's fundamentally an engineering problem, and they will not deal with the the numbers of it. What was your uh, what's what was your most successful hack at MIT? Um, let's see. Uh, well, uh, okay, I had a couple of really nice ones. Uh, one of them was Can Magazine, which was the first magazine in a can. And uh, that was just a, uh, a, a literary hack. We, uh, it was a, a spoof on, on, uh, on pop art, where uh, we put a magazine in a, can in a Campbell soup can. It was art, literature, and poetry, student art, literature, and poetry. It was kind of like a way of meeting girls, you know. But, you know, would you like to be published in a, uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, uh, but it, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we put it in a, uh, so we had this roll, magazine rolled up in a Campbell soup can. We had a run of a thousand of them. And uh, it, it uh, got an article in uh, Time magazine, actually. And, uh, and my mother, uh, who was in advertising in Madison Avenue and stuff, she had uh, some contacts with uh, Andy Warhol. She got us an interview with Andy Warhol, and he actually signed one of the cans. We went down and interviewed him uh, for the second edition, which never actually happened. And so that was uh, quite a... Quite any, any visits to the dean's office in terms of don't do that? Uh, no, no, no. I, uh, uh, though I could have... Uh, I. I I, I could have uh, had. It could some. have happened. <laughs> it could have happened, but I. You just didn't get I, caught. I, I, uh, I did. Uh, I did do a a, a a neon sign hack, where I altered a neon sign, a gigantic neon sign, but I won't go into the details on that. <laughs> I. Uh, <laughs> we all have those little bits of history which that, we. We're glad are not preserved on YouTube now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that could have gotten me into the dean's office, you know. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, anyway. Well, so what were some of the projects that you, you, do, you did at the uh, undergraduate level? Oh, um, well, uh, I, uh, I did have a senior project where I was, um, uh, I uh, tried to, uh, uh, observe a, uh, a microwave line of silicon hydride because uh, the uh, radio astronomers were looking for it in, um, in, uh, in clouds in space and they needed to know what the frequency was and so I, I uh, tried to uh, you know generate silicon hydride and, and measure a microwave frequency of it but I didn't I didn't actually get it so but but that was an interesting uh, from the point of view of, uh, of getting my hands dirty and, and with building apparatus and learning some microwave technology and and, uh, and 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 visits to the MIT machine shop for students and so on. Yes, and I, I worked in the machine shop yeah. and, and, and did and, and made and I and I did some microwave work as well. And so uh, that I learned a lot of electronics. Yeah. Which was a, who was a professor you worked with? That was uh, John King. He he was my senior advisor. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, Anyway, the uh, so that that was on the academic side, yes. And uh, uh, I also had a uh, there was a oh yeah there was a techni uh, a technology hack that I did uh, that uh, 
uh, was I attempted to, uh, to make industrial diamonds uh, in my uh, dormitory room. I had a 20-ton uh, press. I still have the jack in my garage, actually. And uh, the idea was to try to come up with a process for doing it at a lower temperature and pressure than uh, people normally work at. And the idea was to uh, use a chemical reaction that would precipitate carbon at a lower temperature and pressure rather than trying to get graphite to transmute into the diamond structure, precipitate carbon into the, into the diamond structure at a lower temperature and pressure. And, and, so, uh, and so the apparatus for that would be a lot cheaper than to, uh, to work at the higher temperature and pressure. And so I, we were at uh, 20, uh, let's see now, we were, uh, I, I think I got about, I think I was getting about 50 kilobars. And, uh, and so we made a, um, a, uh, a little, you know, the uh, pressure vessel and we heated it to 500 degrees C and every now and then it would blow up in the room and, and uh, the, but it was contained within a steel structure, but it would go bang, and, and we maintained the pressure um, uh, by putting 50 pounds of barbell weights on a two pound, uh, a two, two foot long steel pipe uh, on the jack. And so this would be, uh, um, you know, maintaining the pressure. And it would have to, as a reaction proceeded, we'd have to keep cranking it up. But if the pressure vessel blew, then the thing would come crashing down to the floor. And then the guy downstairs would come running out, what the hell's going on up here? And so, oh, we're just making diamonds, you know. <laughs> anyway, you know. So, but uh, we got uh, a highly amorphous form of carbon. We probably were generating vitreous carbon well before its time. Now people make vitreous carbon for dental implants, but anyway, we, we, we did an x-ray analysis of it, and it was probably vitreous carbon. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so uh, after MIT, uh, where did you go? Uh, oh, uh, well, I, yeah, I, I went to, uh, I decided to go to Caltech. I could have gone to MIT for graduate school, but I decided to go to Caltech. And, uh, you know, the, uh, it had a better uh, reputa reputation for high energy physics, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, I had a full scholarship there, and so I decided to go to Caltech. And, uh, and there I, uh, uh, I did the first year uh, doing uh, coursework in Pasadena, and, uh, and then I s went on to uh, start uh, working at the Lawrence uh, Radiation Lab in Berkeley on an experiment uh, 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 in following that year. Uh, and uh, in that first year, actually, one of the uh, things I wanted to talk about a little bit was uh, that uh, Professor Charles Barnes uh, had mentioned uh, in a lecture uh, in uh, in the physics course that I was taking, um, that something that uh, knocked my socks off at the time and got me going onto a thought that went on for 50 years and is uh, alive today and I'm still talking about it. And he mentioned uh, that uh, in the fusion process that, uh, that operates in the sun, uh, the uh, two protons come together and they stick together very temporarily and then they, most of the time they fly apart but uh, every now and then one of them turns into a neutron by the weak interaction and now you have deuterium and then the deuterium can go on to fuse into, into uh, helium and, uh, and produce you know, the, uh, the energy of the sun over billions of years. Uh, but most of the time they fly apart and in fact they stick together for about a hundredth of a trillionth of a second. Um, but if the nuclear interaction were about half a percent stronger than it is, then they would stick together permanently and form helium too. And then uh, the sun could burn much more vigorously than it does and in fact it would burn up in the period of, uh, of a million years instead of billions of years. 
and that we would have absolutely no t opportunity to evolve. And uh, there would not be the possibility of anything like us evolving anywhere in the universe. And that just knocked my socks off. If the nuclear interaction were half a percent stronger than it is. Okay, well, I went on to think about this, and I've identified now 17 aspects of physical law, including this one that I've just stated, that have to be more or less exactly the way they are in order for anything like us to have evolved anywhere in the universe. And I've written a book about it called Our Improbable Universe. And anyway, that's something that's been a life's work, and it's very, been very important to me. And it's just, uh, it's, it's phenomenal that we have come into existence. We have this precious reality, and uh, we really should be taking better care of it than we do. <laughs> so, I, I've read parts of the book, and um, you really, it's very wide-ranging, and it's very interesting. Um, it, it, and you're kind of got some speculation in there about, you know, maybe there are a lot of choices of how you might have a universe, and maybe we're just the lucky one. Right. There's, um, there's two hypotheses uh, as to how you could get these 17 things just right. Some people call it the Goldilocks universe, and there's been a lot of, and one would be a deistic hypothesis that involves uh, a creator manipulating the physical parameters to get things just right. And that's in which case, you know, you've got to say, well, uh, this creator went to a lot of trouble. You, you just can't throw it away, you got to, <laughs> which we're doing. <laughs> We're showing every sign of doing. Uh, the other hypothesis is that uh, it was a random happening that got these 17 things just right. Well, people who plug in the numbers, how, what is the probability? How many times do you have to throw the dice in order to, for a random happening to generate? You're talking about numbers like 10 to the hundredth. We've got the one universe in 10 to the hundredth. And, and some people, uh, and propose that we may in fact exist in a larger meta-universe in which the dice has been thrown 10 to the hundredth time and we have this one universe in 10 to the hundredth that is just right which makes it a very special place and so my position is reality is special either way <laughs> and you have to tra treat it as sacred either way right. Good point. Anyway. It comes from a particle physicist uh, point of view, understanding of uh, reality. Yes, and, and, and that's, that, that's the whole, my whole position is that it's, we have this incredible reality and we really have to, we have to treat it much better than we are. Now how about for your uh, uh, thesis work at Caltech? What did well, you work on? Uh, well, that, that also uh, turned out to be part of the book. It, it turned out to be part of these 17 things, and I didn't really appreciate it at the time that I was working on it, but uh, and one of the reasons why I wrote the book was when I realized uh, its connections to uh, reality, uh, uh, it, it also motivated me to, get, to do the book. But uh, the, the, the thesis was uh, to look for a violation of a symmetry principle in physics that uh, physicist thought applied to reality, and it's called CP, that is charge conjugation parity. Those are just the terms that he used. And what it corresponds to, uh, the symmetry principle was that they thought existed, was that if you changed all the particles into antiparticles uh, and looked at the system in a mirror, that the equations should be exactly the same. Okay, that's called CP symmetry. That is, all the particles turned into antiparticles, look at it in a mirror, equations should be exactly the same. Turns out they aren't, that there's a tiny violation at the level of parts per billion. Good thing, turns out. I, I only found this out, you know, many, many years after I did my thesis. Uh, and I did my thesis on this topic. Uh, because if CP symmetry were an exact symmetry, we could not exist because the Big Bang would have produced an exactly equal amount of matter and antimatter. 
if CP symmetry were exact. And then in the first few minutes, all the matter would have annihilated with all the antimatter and the universe would have been nothing but a ball of, of photons and neutrinos expanding to infinity forever. There would be no stable matter at all in it. But because CP symmetry is violated at, a tiny, at the level of parts per billion, a tiny excess of matter over antimatter was generated in the Big Bang. We are that tiny excess. So it wasn't the big poof, it was the Big Bang. <laughs> Pardon me? It wasn't the big poof where it happened and that was it. <laughs> right. Well, it, it's possible that it's cyclic. We don't know. But, right. but, the, uh, but it's, uh, the cyclic uh, thing is um, not favored at this time. Uh, but at any rate. Um, uh, but the, when I found out about the implications of the CP violation, uh, and the existence of matter, th then that was another motivation. My, my, my thesis project was to look for CP violation, uh, a large CP violation in a particular interaction. I did not find it. It, it did not occur. Uh, the small CP violation had already been observed by Fitch and Cronin a few years before, and they, they received a Nobel Prize for the observing it. Anyway, at that time was not appreciated uh, when they saw it, uh, this connection between the CP violation and the existence of an excess of matter. That uh, existence uh, uh, of the excess of matter over antimatter wasn't figured out until about 1971, um, theoretically. Uh, but that also depended upon something else, too. It also depended upon the existence of at least six quarks. And I was also involved later on with uh, the discovery of additional quarks. Uh, in my work in high energy physics, I was involved with the discovery of the fifth quark. Uh, we, uh, in an experiment that I was involved in in, in the late 70s, in the mid 70s, uh, at Fermilab, uh, when I was working at Northeastern University teaching physics there, um, we were doing an experiment at Fermilab where we were looking for evidence for uh, the existence of an addition, uh, a fifth quark. At that point, uh, of evidence that existed for a fourth quark. Uh, in the original quark model, there were only three. Then a fourth one was, uh, evidence for a fourth was discovered. And then at that point, it also became apparent that quarks occurred in pairs, so that if there were a fifth, there had to be a sixth. Well, if there was six, then that allowed the CP violation to conspire with the existence of six quarks to produce this excess of matter over antimatter. Anyway, the, uh, we, at this, this experiment we uh, were doing, uh, we found uh, uh, about 100 up upsilon particles at a three sigma level. Uh, and, but uh, Leon Letterman, at the same time was doing a much more uh, larger experiment. He got about 10,000 of these particles and he published on that. He did present our data as backup to his. And uh, anyway, he got Nobel Prize for the fifth quark. And, so um, if you had better equipment, you might have had a chance. Uh, well, anyway, he, he was, he, you know, anyway. He, anyway, but if there are five, there's six. Anyway, the six was discovered about 20 years later, and, uh, and anyway, uh, 1995. And, uh, and, and when I f figured, found out about all this stuff, then you know, that really motivated me to you know, put this all together and, identify and, and, and write the book. So the career goes from Caltech with the PhD to high energy physics and teaching at Northeastern. Have I got that kind of scenario correct? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> now going beyond Northeastern and what does a high energy physicist do uh, in the future? Well, the, the problem was at Northeastern, you know, I had to, um, um, I had to cross rip, rip off park every day uh, on my way home. I got mugged once and, uh, you know, I, uh, I got away, but, and my daughter was uh, going to a, um, a daycare with the, uh, uh, kids hit, kick, and spit, and I decided I needed to earn a living wage. 
and uh, and so uh, I decided to go into industry, and uh, I I uh, was I had a lot of experience uh, with um, uh, uh, big magnets, so I figured I could use my background uh, in with Maxwell's equations, you know, and. Uh, to do magnetics. So I got a, a jo job with Magnetic Corporation of America doing large magnets for various purposes, fusion, high energy physics, um, uh, magnetic separation, uh, and uh, other, uh, and power generation, various other, other things. They were in Boston or Cambridge? Or? Th that was in Waltham, Mass. Waltham, okay. And uh, anyway, they, and they they were being uh, they, they had some uh, financial backing from some uh, from a uh, venture capital, but um, and and that was a uh, it was a nice job. I, I liked that. I was doing a lot of different things. I was getting um, experience in a lot of different, it gave me experience in the power industry, you know. And I and and that's, this is also part of my involvement with global warming and stuff. I understand how to make electricity and what and what the parameters are of the electric power industry. Anyway, the uh, um, the uh, uh, after a couple of years, though they they started having financial difficulties. They weren't getting the backing uh, anymore, and so uh, I decided I'd better look for another job. And I uh, went. I told my I did some looking around. I could see there was excitement in um, in uh, magnetic storage, and I asked my uh, uh, headhunter to get me an interview in the, in the disk drive industry, and he did. And uh, well, uh, so I got a, an interview with uh, digital equipment, and uh, a, uh, I was being interviewed by uh, a, a mechanical engineer named Mitch Szymanski, and uh, at that time I didn't really know um, I did a little bit of research about on magnetic recording, you know, and uh, I knew about longitudinal recording. I didn't know about perpendicular recording, really, but uh, uh, and I didn't know about Iwasaki-san in Japan um, uh, doing perpendicular recording with a with a monopole head. Uh, but uh, but I told him at some point I, I forget whether it was you know I. Gone home and come back for a second interview, but at some point I told Mitch, "You guys are doing this thing all wrong. You shouldn't be doing this longitudinal recording. You ought to be doing perpendicular. And this is a head you ought to use." And I sketched the shielded pole head form. <laughs> that was in the job interview. Well, anyway, I got the job, and uh, and uh, and then uh, I joined Digital Equipment to work on thin film heads and doing magnetic analysis for thin film heads and. Uh, and uh, while I was doing that, you know, and developing the uh, thin film head for uh, the RA90 disk drive, um, I uh, also continued in analyzing uh, this sh shielded pole head that I'd sketched out for Mitch. And, uh, and I, it looked pretty good and, uh, uh, in terms of analytic uh, calculations. Then I did some finite element analysis with it and still looked pretty good. And uh, so I applied for a patent on it, and the patent issued in 1987. And, uh, and that, that's, that's the one that, uh, that Tom uh, referred to in the introduction. Well, um, so, uh, and then I continued working at, at Digital uh, on uh, refining the uh, thin film head and produced a number of, uh, of uh, insights into the functioning of that head. I think they, one of the valuable things I did was to figure out how the r flux conducted during the readback process, and that was important because in the readback process you don't want any um, noise from what's called Barkhausen uh, noise, which uh, corresponds to domain wall motion getting hung up on defects in the structure and then jumping suddenly. You want to conduct flux by rotation of the magnetization and not by wall motion. Well, I figured out how flux could be conducted by rotation without wall motion. And people all thought up until then that the, that uh, that always required some degree of wall motion. I figured out how to do it without any wall motion. As long as the rotations were small, you didn't require wall motion. Well, readback doesn't require big rotations. It's only small rotations. 
So, uh, and I was able to show this analytically and all that. And, uh, and it was important because when you design the magnetic structure and you, you burn in what's called magnetic anisotropy, you want to put it in in a way such that you can conduct the flux through the entire structure by rotation without wall motion. And I got patents on how to do that and how to put in the, uh, the, uh, the you know, the, but you, you plate the magnetic films in a, in a plating field. Anyway, uh, so that was one of the contributions I made to the theory of flux conduction. Um, and, um, and I also did a number of things, you know, in terms of understanding, uh, you know, problems in producing the thin film heads and, and how to improve the design and, uh, and um, improve the, uh, the right process. Uh, and this and is all occurring in the deck facility in Shrewsbury? Yes. Yeah, Bob yeah. Rottenmeyer was running the yes, film and, head group there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and but and uh, and it was uh, I had a lot of fun there, and because you know, uh, and I've been thinking about you know, you know why it was that you know I was you know things were so synergistic, and it was the managers were all technical people, they'd all were hands-on technical people, you know, and and so we were just all on the same wavelength. Uh -huh. It really helped a lot, you right. know. You so know. the same Bob Rottenmeyer that went to Seagate and rewrite? Yes, yes, yeah. And, and he was a very hands-on technical person, yeah. you know. And, uh, the first physicist I ever hired <laughs> right, <laughs> was Bob. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anyway, I was talking with Bob yesterday. Actually. Oh, okay. I just, I just I went up to visit him yesterday. Oh, know, terrific. And, and, Wonderful. Uh, it's on my to-do list, but I haven't done it. Yeah. Um, anyway. uh, so, so uh, the, uh, the goal, I think, if I you know, put something in here from my memory, uh, was that DEC's going to catch up with uh, IBM's aerial densities. And um, the RA-90, I think, was the... the attack at that. Um, so you were working on that project and you know that was was the goal achieved do you think? Um, well I, I I think we yeah we were we were being competitive we got we got competitive with IBM for sure yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, and then uh, but then uh, IBM what happened is IBM came out with the uh, Mag uh, magneto resistive reed back head. You know, they had developed that, and we were still on inductive head technology. And so I came up with a concept of ex that could extend inductive reed back uh, called the diamond head, which was really cute. It, uh, it was really a nice invention. Um, where normally, uh, uh, you know, you, in read back, you conduct the read flux through a coil, and that stimulates a voltage in the coil. So you, the, the, uh, the magnetic yoke structure takes the read back flux off the disk and channels it through a coil. And, uh, and then that creates a voltage in the coil. Uh, the idea of the diamond head was instead of uh, instead of running the readback flux through the coil once the way a yoke normally does, the diamond head run ran that flux through the coil twice. So that the effective number of turns was the number of coil turns times the number of yoke turns. Normally, the number of yoke turns is just once. Diamond head, it was twice. And and I figured out a geometry that you could execute in thin film technology where you could get the yoke to pass through the coil twice. And uh, it was really neat. I nearly, knocked, I nearly fell off the chair when I, when I uh, uh, you know, realized what I've done. <laughs> and it, was, it was a really cute idea. But it, it was only the, there, though, to provide us with uh, more readback signal to uh, buy us a little time to develop MR technology to catch up with IBM again, you know. And, and so it was only for a, a couple of generations that the diamond head was useful. And, uh, but it was a really nice, neat, neat idea. But at the same time, though, uh, um, we, we also got involved with uh, NSIC, uh, National Storage Industry Consor Consortium, where the idea was to collaborate with other uh, corporations in, in, the di in the disk drive industry to uh, advance uh, magnetic recording uh, 
as a group because we we all were using each other's patents anyway you know we might as well collaborate on the uh, fundamental developments of, of the intellectual uh, property to begin with you know uh, and so uh, as part of NSIC though we we wanted to uh, you know extend uh, uh, recording past the limits of what longitudinal could do and we figured out that the way to do it was with perpendicular recording and that the shielded pole head was the way to do it. And that in the early 90s time frame, uh, NSIC, uh, you know, I worked with NSIC and other people like Mason Williams and Roger Wood and, and we figured out that we could extend uh, perpendicular recording to a terabit per square inch using the shielded pole architecture and a perpendicular recording. And, uh, and we, we pretty much put a stake in the ground in the early 90s time frame uh, that said, this is what we can do, and this is what we ought to be doing. And, and that created a whole impetus to do the developments, both in the disc technology, the head technology, and uh, you know, to realize that you know, these, what, what this architecture could achieve. It took you know, a huge team effort. You know, it wasn't just, you know, the idea of the shield of pull head. It's also this huge team effort. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I'm very much into is the idea of collectivity of mind. Team effort. That's, that's what makes this world go around. You know, lots of people working on this stuff together, you know, and working on the ideas and working on the action, making things work together. Anyway, the... Um, we, we figured out in the early 90s a terabit per square inch was feasible. That was achieved in about 2013 in product shipped. Wow. <laughs> and it actually hasn't gone much further than that. 25 years. It, hasn't, it, has, it, it pretty much stalled at that level. That's, that's, that's where we're, we're at in hard disk technology today. And so you and Mason William from IBM and Roger Wood, I don't know if whether, whether he was at... Uh, IBM already or not, you were responsible for roadmaps and and uh, modeling for the uh, NSEC. Um, uh, how was that teamwork uh, like? Did you uh, did you collaborate uh, extensively to do that, or oh. just at the meeting? Well, it, uh, we, we, would, we would meet frequently, you know, and we'd go back home and, you know, do our own calculations and come and present, you know, and it was a, it was a very collaborative process. It was a lot of fun, you know, and it, uh, it was really, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 it was a great example of teamwork. It really was, and it, uh, it, it, how, how things should work, you know, and, uh, and it, and we, we, you know, and so, we, you know, we we we'd shown you know what the, what what the path into the future should be, and then by the early 2000 time frame, uh, it, you know, when lo when longitudinal really was running out of gas, and and it, and it became clear that we had to switch over to perpendicular. Well, that that patent from 1987 was running out, and uh, so I was asked to uh, do a picket fence around it. Uh, and that is to create a whole bunch of subsidiary patents that, uh, and so I, I went back and patented a whole bunch of, uh, submitted patents on a whole bunch of other ideas, and I ended up getting about eight, eight more patents on uh, on the basic shielded pole type. This is still a digital technology. Pardon still me? a digital. Uh, well, that that would. I don't know. It was, I'm not sure which. I think they they probably were submitted or. or when I was with Quantum, and then that, then that, then it was I don't know. Then then it was inherited by the next corporation that took over. You know, it was just one. I'm not sure exactly who owned what when. <laughs> you know, um, there, there's a couple instances where the kind of the scientific method was failing the engineers, and they had no clue as to what was going wrong. And you were asked to come down out of your physicist ivory tower and fix stuff on the production line. Can you tell us about some of those experiences? Oh, right. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, there was a, an erase problem in the, uh, R I think it's R81 disk drive. And uh, there was a problem where there was, uh, the disk drive was uh, losing its memory. And, uh, Not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it, uh, 
and over a period of time, the data would gradually corrupt. And, uh, and it was driving people nuts, of course, you know, because uh, and the product was on ship hold and it, uh, very expensive, you know. Um, anyway, uh, I, uh, this is where my experience at Magnetic Corporation of America helped a lot, actually, because I had, I had been involved in magnetic separation of fine particles. And uh, so I, I knew particles. And uh, anyway, I, I figured out that the, uh, you know, after, you know, getting involved with a problem, that, the, that it was magnetic particles stuck to the uh, edge of the uh, slider uh, were erasing the disk and uh, over a period of time. Uh, and, uh, how, and how did you come to that conclusion? I forget exactly, but I, I, I think it, uh, uh, you know, I, I think with, 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 with all these things, you know, it's kind of like an intuitive, you know, you, you just, it kind of kind of comes to you, you know, in, in your sleep or whatever, you know, you, <laughs> it, it just, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you know what, mm -hmm. you know what uh, stimulated me to to think that it was magnetic part. For one thing, you know the the sliders at that time themselves were magnetic, mm -hmm. and and so you know the fact that you know magnetic particles could stick to the magnetic slider, you right? They're magnetically ferrite, ferrite sliders, right? Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah, uh, you know, and uh, so um, the. Uh, but uh, then I, I, what I did with, though was I figured out that uh, a, a technique for figuring out where the particle was on the slider by uh, writing a bunch of test tr tracks on a, on, a, on a disk, write a bunch of test tracks, stop the disk, and then I'd push the, uh, I'd push the uh, slider across the test tracks to varying de uh, degrees. And, and then I'd uh, take, take that slider away and I'd spin the disk up and read it again and look for the corruption of those tracks that had been pre-written. And based on the corruption of the tracks, I could figure out the uh, location on the slider of the corrupting particle. And then having figured out the location on the slider, I was able to go into the, uh, look, look for that particle in a sim find the particle and use uh, EDX to identify the material that the particle was made out of. It was made out of samarium cobalt. Aha! It came out of the positioner motor uh, because that was samarium cobalt. That was the source of samarium cobalt. And yes, we found out that the magnets, that uh, the positioner magnets in the, Samir in, the, uh, in the positioner motor were only epoxy coated on on, uh, on uh, let's say, uh, five of their six sides. And, uh, that, uh, uh, and so uh, what we did with them was we said, oh, we gotta coat them on all six sides. Because what, what, what's, what was happening was that they, uh, when they were being put in the ultrasonic bath to clean these positioner motors, that was shaking loose particles and those particles are getting all over the place and contaminating everything. And so, anyway, it, uh, we disk drives have all these magic little things that are going on that are very not, they're not very intuitive, you know, yeah. until you really start getting into it and looking and looking and looking. Right? Yeah. yeah. But I, anyway, I was, by, by identifying, by finding the particle and identifying it, it was un unambiguously able to show it was the position of motors and, and solve it. Yeah. This is a huge problem. Oh, oh, it was a very program? expensive problem, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it was the flagship large disk product at the time, and uh, I don't know, hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars a year in revenue, so yeah. it was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you didn't have the disk drives, you couldn't ship the computer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were there other problems like this that you solved? Or? Um, I, I think there were. I, I don't recall, uh, I, I, I can't recall exactly uh, uh, what those others were though at this point, you know, and, but I think that was, that was the big one. But I, I, did, I did end up troubleshooting a lot of things and I, I always considered those Sherlock Holmes things to be a lot of fun, you know. Sure. 
Yeah. You, you uh, later uh, we, we, you were talking about a, um, how corrosion was happening in a recording head that was flying. Oh yes, yes, yeah. that, 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 was, that was one of those. Yeah, one of those. Right. Say a few words about that. Right. Well, th that was yeah. That was that that had to do with uh, yeah understanding a, a wide range of physics too. You know because. Um, um, yeah, we were we were seeing uh, corrosion of the uh, pole tips, and uh, you know, well, why were these pole tips corroding? You know, and the, you know, where's the water coming from? You know, these these disk drives are dry. You know, why 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 is it getting wet? You know, uh, and uh, well, it really is a no-brainer uh, because you know the the pressure at the air bearing surface is many many atmospheres. So if you have a relative humidity of, uh, of even 5% and you compress that air to 20 atmospheres, you're at 100% humidity. That's wet, <laughs> you know? And, and so that's what the problem is, is that, you know, the, um, even if you have a, you know, even if you're in Arizona, <laughs> you're gonna have a, right where the pole tip is, it's wet. <laughs> it's a very wet environment because the pressure is so high. And uh, and so, uh, well, that's why the pole tips corrode, <laughs> you know. And 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 so, what would happen though is, is that you know, contact with a disc would would gradually scrape away the carbon on the pole tips, and then then they became susceptible to cor this corrosion from the wet environment. But no one could understand where the corrosion was coming from because oh, it's no one no one's throwing water in the drive, you know. I mean, but anyway, I was able to. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So when the physicist interacts with the production people and the engineers, how does that go? Um, let's see. Uh, I, I I think I'm 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 pretty patient. I I think so. You know, it takes a while, but you know, you you know, you, you have to say the same thing many times. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then, but you get through. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. yeah. So the math and the science eventually wins. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about uh, about science is you know that it, it's true whether or not you believe it. <laughs> so uh, Deck gets acquired by Quantum, right? I mean, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, but you stay in the in 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 the Boston area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, I, I used to joke that I, uh, you know, I'd just stay in the same place in the corporations and keep moving, moving through, you know. But anyway, but they. Uh, um. So how did that? How did that work? You you developed some more, some further uh, evolutionary advances. At this point, was the perpendicular recording uh, being shipped? Well, uh, yeah, but we. Um, uh, started shipping perpendicular in the uh, in the mid uh, around 2005, I guess you know, and, uh, and with the shielded pole architecture. All right, so it was later. And and there though uh, we uh, the, the task came became to actually get all our vendors to produce the shielded pole head, because one one of the things about the shielded pole head is it's not easy to produce. Okay, it does uh, it does have a uh, a uh, lapping criteria that is stringent. And so uh, you have to lap it accurately to a certain uh, 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 tolerance. And, uh, and so it's not, you know, that's, that's the one difficulty. And first, at first you've got a no-can-do attitude, but then, you know, when people see the advantage of it, then they, Figure they, out they, a way. they overcome it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, and now it's you know it's been standard practice. It's been in every disk drive now since 2005, pretty much. Pretty much, right? Yeah. right. So that gets uh, recording to uh, a terabyte per square inch. Is that about yes, right? Yes, a terabit. Terabit, terabit per square inch. Terabit, yeah, right. yeah, and and uh, but we're pretty pretty stuck there, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's uh, and they we're trying to. It's it's difficult to get beyond. Uh, now, uh, their NSIC uh, was pushed in the direction of, of Hammer uh, as being the preferred technology uh, for the future beyond what, that. What is Hammer? Ha oh, yes. Uh, sorry. A hammer is heat-assisted magnetic recording where you actually heat up the disk where you're trying to record the bits. 
but the temperatures involved are very high. Uh, you have to heat the, uh, the disk uh, above what's called the Curie temperature, which is about five, 600 degrees centigrade. My experience with materials uh, uh, in science, and I actually learned this in my, uh, my diamond making pro project, <laughs> was that uh, you go above 500 degrees centigrade and everything has trouble. And my, my uh, diamond-making vessels would explode at 500 degrees centigrade. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, materials have a lot of trouble above 500 C, you know, and this is, and so hammer really does have a lot of difficulty with material reliability. And uh, and I uh, I I was uh, I, I've not been a big enthusiast of ha of heat assisted magnetic recording mm -hmm. for that reason. It, mm -hmm. It's always scared me. What problem does the heat solve? Well, the 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 heat enables you. That's a good question. And and what it is is that um, the you have to. Um, uh, reduce the grain size in order to uh, record finer bits. You need uh, to uh, an, an adequate number of grains in each bit so that you have a decent signal to noise. And uh, so you, you need to make, if you want to make the bits smaller, you'll have to make the grains smaller. Well, if you make the grains smaller, uh, they lose their ability to stay magnetized against thermal agitation unless you increase what's called their magnetic anisotropy. Well, their magnetic anisotropy is how much magnetic field it takes to switch them. And if you increase their magnetic anisotropy too much, you can't provide enough magnetic field to switch them uh, with uh, any magnetic material that you can uh, come up with in nature. There just aren't any magnetic materials that are have enough magnetization to switch high magnetic anisotropy materials. So it's, a, it's a write problem. You can't, you yes. can't write the bit. You're right. So the way to overcome that is to heat the materials up. And when you heat them up, that lowers their magnetic anisotropy so that you can write them. And then so that when you cool down, that then their magnetic anisotropy goes back to a high value. And then they retain their magnetization in that uh, you know, magnetized state at the low temperature. And so then your bits become thermally stable and at room temperature and, and, uh, and they retain their magnetization. And so, yeah, the, the heat assisted allows you to write very high magnetic anisotropy materials that will retain their magnetization even when the grains are very tiny and otherwise would decay thermally. Where does the heat come from? Uh, typically from a laser, you know, uh, but you could do other ways, but uh, so from a laser. So that's a laser in yeah. the recording head? To yeah, you, you have a little, some kind of light pipe to concentrate a laser uh, beam down to a very fine point mm -hmm. and, uh, and try to, uh, uh, you know, create a tiny spot on the disc that uh, records your bit and then uh, it's very hard to combine the uh, the laser light with the magnetic field, and but the uh, and then but the the fundamental problem though is is this uh, uh, the very high temperatures and and the fact that you need disc lube to uh, uh, in order to be able to fly your head at a very low spacing, and and the lube itself you know gets corrupted by the heat and 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 again you know you you have to have a sealed job to keep water out because uh, again you know the at the high air bearing pressures water will condense and form you know uh, and then that that becomes a problem in the right process and you get pole corrosion associated with uh, the high temperatures plus the water <laughs> and it just uh, it's and and not only the poles corrode but also the ceramics surrounding the uh, the structure they they dissolve at the high temperatures and <laughs> it's, it's it's really a horrendous materials problem and uh, I, I, it just 
scares the hell out of me from a, from a reliability point of view. Yeah. So, I is any is there a product shipping with it? Um, no, <laughs> not uh, no. Not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. No. That's my understanding. Supposedly, though, uh, Seagate supposedly shipping, but. I, uh, it's not, I, it's not so I clear. made an inquiry on that subject last month, uh, two days ago, uh -huh. and the answer was no, uh, uh, by someone who knows. Right. And uh, anyway. But you have worked on this uh, when you went to Seagate for a little while. Yes, I, I did work on that at Seagate for a while, and then, but I also at the same time I started working on uh, on microwave assisted magnetic recording, and uh, that, and that that's why I've, I worked on microwave-assisted magnetic recording, which turns out to be a pr problematic too. It's not as easy as I had hoped. So this was, so now you, you've, you've gone to quantum and then Maxtor acquires quantum and now you're, you're, you move to the Seagate Research Center in Pittsburgh. Is that yeah, right? then, then Seagate acquired from Ma uh, Maxtor and then, and then, uh, then I, I was, I had to move to Seagate, to the Research Center in Pittsburgh but then they closed that, and uh, so I, uh, the Seagate, the research center in Pittsburgh. So I decided to retire from Seagate and go back to uh, Massachusetts because my daughter said, "Oh, good, we can go back to Massachusetts." And so I said, "All right, so, yeah." So I had visited the uh, Seagate Research Center. Bob Rottmeyer was running the. So we were working for him again in, in uh, Pittsburgh, right? Let's see, I don't think I was working for Bob at that time, okay. actually, no, no. But that was kind of this huge investment that they made in this research center and then shut it down. What happened? Right, I, 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 I'm not, I wasn't really aware of all the, uh, you know, the, the, what was going on at the higher levels. You know, Mark Kreider was, you know, was the person who wanted to set up that research center and I suppose, uh, you know, that was, you know, his political, uh, situation wasn't wasn't as good as it might have been I don't know I, I, I don't know what the details of that were. right so is that is, uh, is, is the research thread going on somewhere else now in Seagate I I just I'm not I'm not privy to those issues and so I just can't, I can't so how long were you in Pittsburgh uh, I think it was about two years two years okay yeah. short yeah. short stint yeah and uh, you worked on MAMR at uh, Pittsburgh as well. Well, I also I started. Yeah, I was doing uh, some work on MAMR at the same time too. Yeah, and uh, I I had I'd been working on Hammer and MAMR, and uh, and anyway, I, I decided to take a retirement package. I went back to uh, to Mass Massachusetts, and then I uh, I got a, uh, a, a position with Western Digital, uh, work, you know, working with with them on. Uh, on Mammer. And so this was a consulting relations there in California and you're in Boston? Yeah, and I, I was traveling out to uh, uh, to California and uh, I ended up commuting to Japan too and mm -hmm. and I had a gigantic carbon footprint there for a while, you know, and I it was pretty unconscionable actually. <laughs> but Japan anyway. uh, with with uh, Western Digital or? That, yeah, that was with, well let's see now. No wait, hold on. No, initially it was with HGST. Oh, HGST. Okay. Initially it was with HGST. No, I, I, initially I, I believe I uh, yeah went went to uh, work for HGST. No, hold on. No, I went. Uh, it was W Western Digital first. Maybe. I went to yeah Western Digital and then. And then. Then they acquired HGST, so yeah, yeah. And then they acquired fine. HGST, and then I, I was working with HGST on on uh, on Mammer. On that was it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what is the right. theory behind Mammer? How does it work? Okay. Well, the idea there is that um, that if you um, if you have a uh, a magnetic uh, particle and uh, you apply a uh, microwave field to it, you can get its magnetization to start precessing around in response to the uh, high frequency magnetic applied magnetic field, and so that you can get it to switch at, with a lower applied field than you otherwise would take, because you can get it to start 
precessing around to larger and larger angles with this applied microwave field. And uh, it's uh, when you go to uh, you know a magnetic resonance imaging system, you know your uh, the electrons in your brain or whatever is being imaged are precessing around in response to that magnetic field. And well, it, similarly, uh, the magnetic grains in a uh, in a disk would be precessing around in response to this uh, applied magnetic field, and uh, and that would make it easier to switch them. And uh, the the trouble is to is to get a strong enough uh, applied RF field uh, in combination with the right field of the head, and uh, and and the, this is the, then you have microwave assisted magnetic recording, and they call it MAMR. Mm -hmm. And what microwave frequencies are typically used? Uh, you're up around 20 gigahertz. Okay. You know that's a pretty high frequency. Mm -hmm. You know. And, uh, and in order to do that, you need what's called a spin torque oscillator in the head. And uh, Jimmy Zhu at uh, Carnegie Mellon University has been a big proponent of that. And I, and I did a, uh, I did a lot of work with using his software and, uh, and, uh, um, and a lot of his uh, concepts. Uh, you know, uh, I built on a lot of his concepts too, uh, uh, in what I was doing. So, which, what's What's your bet for that being something for the future, mainstream? Uh, I, I think I really have to, at this point, you know, self-censor on, on, on that because I'm, I'm actively consulting on the issue and I, I really shouldn't, uh, shouldn't comment on All it. All right, but I, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So still reasonably active right now uh, in well, these, uh, we're, advanced topics? Well, we're working on it, you know, but we're, uh, it's... Uh, so what's your average uh, week like? Well, um, I'm, I've, I've been staying busy, uh, you know, uh, somehow. I, I, I don't, I, I'm glad I'm retired. You know, I, I, I do, the consulting I'm doing for uh, Western Digital at this point isn't that much, you know. It's, uh, it's not, not, not that many hours per week or anything. It's, uh, and uh, I, uh, I do. Uh, I rock climb twice a week, you know, just to stay in shape. And um, and I uh, I do uh, I I do give talks on global warming because uh, global warming is my hot button. I, I view it as an existential threat to our species. And it it uh, if you say, well, if you want me to sow a, pr a probability uh, that uh, on uh, uh, maybe it represents a five or ten percent threat, uh, that's way too large. <laughs> Um, and uh, you know, considering what it took to uh, for us to have get to where we are, where we can now pretty much accomplish all the things our ancestors prayed for, we can do now uh, to, <laughs> to throw it all away, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, it's uh, so I give talks on uh, global warming, and uh, I. Uh, I I, I seem to stay, you know, I stay busy. I've, I don't know. What, what other hobbies? Uh, you, you have many, I, it seems. Well, let's see. Uh, actively right now, um, it's just ma it's mainly the you know those th those things actually right now. I've had I've had other hobbies in the past, you know, that I've uh, I've uh, done. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, I, I used to do sculpture, uh, but I'm not. I'm not actively doing that now. Uh, but I, uh, I've, I've, I promote my book. I'm, yeah. I'm so I wanted to give a plug for your book here. Oh, Have yeah, you talked right. a little okay. bit about it? Oh, okay. Well, this is our improbable universe. You know, this is the uh, the. Uh, it was a life's work. I mentioned that I started thinking about this in graduate school, and uh, you know, and it identifies 17 aspects of physical law that have to be more or less exactly the way they are in order for anything like us to have evolved out of the raw energy of the Big Bang anywhere in the universe. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, but because of our, you know, so it took 14 billion years plus these 17 things being more or less just right. And, uh, but because of our addictions to fossil, fossil fuels and to playing serial Russian roulette with nuclear holocaust, 
we threaten to throw it all away in the blink of a cosmic eye. It's just absolutely outrageous. And just uh, and so I, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I give talks on it, and I've been talking about it for 15 years, you know, uh, both in the book and global warming. And uh, and one of my uh, things about global warming, and a lot of uh, a lot of Greens will consider me to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, they don't they don't like it, but a traitor I, I, to the religion. Well, they uh, uh, I. I, I view nuclear power as essential to uh, dealing with a global warming issue, because when the wind don't shine and the sun don't blow, we burn. <laughs> and uh, we, I can show in my presentation that I do on this that we need a 60 percent reduction in carbon emission to stop growing carbon in the air, and, with, and uh, we just can't get there uh, with pure uh, renewables. For example, in 2013, there was a whole week when wind and solar across all of Europe were at 10% of nominal capacity, 10%. So there's no energy storage that can bridge that gap mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, now batteries are getting better, but they're nowhere near good enough to do, to bridge that full week. Yeah, I've, I've given, there's a couple of videos on, on uh, global warming, and there's also a video on the, uh, on the book. And, uh, so, so, you know, you're, educate, you're trying to educate audiences to look at this, I think, analytically and by the numbers. Uh, are you successful in getting people to bridge that from their kind of inherent biases and kind of historical beliefs, you know, do you think you're con making con conversions, you're getting uh, folks who believe what you believe? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, uh, based on uh, the feedback I get from the people I talk to when I give presentations, yes. But, you know, of course, I only reach maybe a couple hundred people a year, you know, <laughs> directly, you know, but maybe they talk to their friends and hopefully. Uh, but one of, the, one of the encouraging things is, is that, um, uh, people are paying a lot more attention now than they have in the past. I mean, I certainly felt like a vo voice crying in the darkness in the past, but uh, now people are really paying attention to this global warming issue. The wildfires in California are causing people to wake up. The extreme weather in, in the Midwest is ca are causing people there to wake up. You know, the fact that uh, we've had uh, the wettest year ever in America is causing people in the Midwest to scratch their heads about whether or not the propaganda from the fossil fuel industry has, you know, not been a lie. In fact, it has been a lie. You know, the, uh, they've known that they've been lying for 42 years. James Black, a senior scientist for ExxonMobil, told management in Manhattan in 1977 that there was scientific agreement at that time that the continued burning of fossil fuel would lead to global warming. That was 42 years ago. Have you, have you pondered ways of leveraging the message into the political and chattering classes? Um, well, I, I talked to my congressman about it two weeks ago, but, oh. but he's, he was already well on board on it. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and he, he in fact, sponsored a, uh, uh, was a, uh, one of the first sponsors of a bill that's in Congress right now, H.R. 763, which is a uh, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, mm -hmm. which, in fact, is a, uh, is a carbon tax, actually. Um, and it's but it's a, it's a revenue revenue neutral tax, mm -hmm. but eighty eighty percent of people would actually gain re financially from it, mm -hmm. and uh, twenty percent would lose. You know, but it uh, it it's being criticized as being a revenue re redistribution. Well, so getting folks to embrace nuclear power. I mean, I think I look. I don't think there's a single presidential candidate with that part of their policy or their message. Well, I'm looking for candidates that don't pan it, uh, you know, uh, you know, overtly. Uh, anyway, the yes, and uh, because you know, pe people are absolutely phobic about it. The average person thinks that coal, that nuclear, is a million times more dangerous than coal. 
The factual reality is exactly the opposite. In the time that nuclear has been around, coal has killed almost a million Americans from uh, air pollution, and coal has yet to kill a single American. The other way around. Yeah. You, 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 you got the words I mean, no, I'm sorry, uh, nuclear has yet to kill a single American. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, I, mis I misstated. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for correcting me. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, the, uh, so it, it, we're, I'm dealing with a phobia. And, uh, you know, that uh, the, the media has really played up the Three Mile Island thing. And uh, Three Mile Island released a negligible amount of radiation into the environment because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in fact, did its job well and required that the containment structures in America have filters on them, which the Japanese uh, regulatory agencies did not require. And therefore, Fukushima released 10 million times more radiation than Three Mile Island did. But there is Fukushima too, and that's concerning every, a lot of people's mind. Right, and that's because they did not have filters on their containment yeah. structures. On my vacation, I read uh, Midnight at Chernobyl, which is a real eye-opener of a book. Right. And, and uh, wow. Right. And, I, I, and I, I, I've read, a, read about Chernobyl recently, too, and uh, my position is, is that the Soviet Union should not have been allowed to make nuclear reactors to begin with yeah. because being a totalitarian state, they had no ability to correct anything mm -hmm. because everything was considered to be a state secret. And so they had no ability to correct anything because of that phenomenon. Now, unfortunately, America is heading in that direction as well. <laughs> so if you go back over your career and, and you know, think about, you, you know, I think one of the things that was kind of in our preparation, you'd said you actually had an opportunity to, you know, work with Richard Feynman or at least take his classes. I mean, that must have been kind of a dramatic uh, experience given what I've seen about him. and. Uh, so when you look back and say, well, here are the big things that kind of made me successful in all the things I did, what, what do you kind of look at as the major milestones along the way? Oh, uh, well, I, I, it, was, it was really gr great to have taken courses with uh, Richard Feynman, you know, and been exposed to that, you know, that, that person. Right. You know, he was, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, Let's see. I, 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 I don't. I don't know that I can identify that as being, you know, that that formative though. Sure. I mean, it's just a nice sure. experience. Right. You know. Right. Uh, it. Uh, uh, he. Uh, let's see. He was just a fine human being, and and one of the. I, I remember one of the things. Uh, you know, was was just a, a reminiscence that he had during, he just pull, uh, stood aside uh, during a lecture once when he was talking about the, uh, the aftermath of the Trinity uh, test and uh, how, you know, 90% of the scientists, uh, you know, were celebrating, you know, oh, this is wonderful, and, but 10% were going around, gee, what did we do? <laughs> you know. And you know we're really we're serious. You know we're really thinking mm -hmm. about what the unleash the genie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what would be your advice to say high school students uh, thinking about a career in physics, as a, as a for instance? Oh, I, th I think it's a uh, a really um, um, nice thing. You know, it's 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 a uh, you know. But it's it's a uh, uh, discoveries are are hard to come by in physics, and you just have to accept the fact that you're gonna that you're gonna be participating in a huge team effort, and uh, and be satisfied with just being part of moving this ball forward a little bit. In general, you might be the person who makes a Einstein type discovery, but probably not. And, uh, but, you know, just be satisfied with being part of a collective effort that is, is moving the overall understanding of physical reality forward by a lot uh, and, and, uh, and the excitement of, uh, of just being at the forefront of, of what's going on. And, uh, and uh, 
I, I, I found it very stimulating, and it, 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 it both in terms of uh, you know the just excitement of the moment, but then it also got me going philosophically, you know, big time, and uh, you know, understanding uh, uh, reality on a philosophical level too. You know, how did your early experiences of making things kind of help you in your career? Oh, a lot. I, I think that was one of the very, uh, actually, I think that's one of the things that really, uh, uh, pe people usually thought of me as being a theorist, you know, and, uh, but I, the fact that I could get in there and get my hands dirty and, uh, and uh, understood stuff down to the uh, nuts and bolts, you know, I think it really helped a lot. The, the reason that I was able to uh, get to the heart of those magnetic particles as a source of erasure had to do with the fact that I was so hands-on. You know that I could I could intuit, you know, the, what was going on there, pretty much right off the bat. You know, uh, and and so uh, I, I I think the 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 hands-on stuff was re very important. And I, I I learned that you know, working in the garage with my father. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know just that's that's where I got my start on that hand. And that actually kind of was you know how things work, you know, and working with my hands. And, uh, it's extremely important, and that, that's unfortunate with, you know, a lot of kids today are just pushing buttons, that's not. Right, you can't go fix your car anymore. No, yeah, and that, that's a real big problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, 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 uh, I tried to rebuild a car yet at one point, yeah. It didn't succeed, but I tried, and I learned a lot by trying. <laughs> you know. You can talk about your family, uh, your children, what they're doing. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, well, I've uh, my young, my oldest daughter is a, is a psychiatrist now with the Veterans Administration, and uh, you know she she has uh, two children, two daughters, and uh, and they uh, let's see, I guess they're uh, they're about seven and nine, uh, 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 Nor and Maya, and. Uh, the uh, let's see. Uh, I have a uh, uh, my uh, a daughter named uh, let's see Caroline. Uh, my, my oldest daughter is uh, Elaine, and Caroline is studying uh, general relativity at uh, University of Massachusetts and in, in um, uh, let's see Dartmouth. And um, the uh, let's see, she's uh, about to wrap that up. And uh, let's see, my uh, youngest daughter, Joanna, is a senior at U University of Connecticut, and she's uh, going to uh, do a PsyD in uh, psychology, and she wants to do uh, therapy in psychology, you know, like my, like my uh, eldest daughter, actually, who's a psychiatrist. But she, uh, Joanna doesn't want to be a psychiatrist. She wants to just be, uh, you know, just a, do a PsyD and do, go out and do therapy. Yeah. So graduate degrees and PhDs run in the family. Yes, I yeah yeah, and and I and I again I, I would trace this whole thing back to my grandparents, you know, as being you know the uh, the uh, the people who really got that those balls rolling, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, I, know. I think it was Richard Feynman who said we're trying to understand time by smashing watches together and looking at the gears and the springs that pop out of that. Oh yeah, that's that's that that's uh, high energy physics experiments. Yes, uh, yeah, that's that, that's basically what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. When we when we crash protons together, yeah, to, to you know, it's a proton is very complicated. It's like you know, yeah, it's like throwing two Swiss watches at each other and trying to understand how they're made by looking at the pieces that fly out. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Did Feynman say that? Yeah, I believe so. It's okay, that's about, that's about right. It's a good analogy. That's about right. He's, he's, he's good at that kind of stuff. Yeah, he's, he's very good at, uh, at, 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 at expressing things in an understandable fashion. Yeah. So we're talking a little bit about there's, there's more to discover in you know, high energy physics, smashing particles together, and so on. So you think there's another whole evolution of what we understand about the fundamental nature oh, of matter? Yeah. There's definitely a, a huge reality underneath what we understand already. Yes, there's gigantic reality under there, and we just the trouble is it might be it, it might be that that the energy level of uh, of that reality might require an accelerator that's uh, the size of the orbit of Jupiter around the sun, and you know we we may not be able to uh, access it uh, experimentally, you know, in order to you know 
and, and that could be a real fundamental problem because, you know, the scientific method has always re relied upon the ability to experimentally verify your theoretical uh, hypotheses. Without that experimental verification, you know, you end up in the woods very quickly. And, and so, uh, you know, it's not clear that science can progress without, you know, I mean, if you need an accelerator that big, you know, to get to that next level of reality, we're in big trouble from the point of view of moving it forward. Now, how about uh, uh, some favorite stories that you might want to recount or, you know, stories uh, about your favorite teacher? Well, um, yeah, I, uh, when I was, um, when my family was in transition from Los Angeles to New York because my mother uh, got her big break in advertising uh, in a job on Madison Avenue, Mad Ave. Um, uh, she, uh, uh, the family had to move back to, you know, from LA to, to New York. Uh, I uh, was temporarily uh, uh, moved to Berkeley and stayed with my aunt, uh, my uh, father's sister, Jean, in Berkeley. And I went to Garfield Junior High School there for uh, about a half a year for seventh grade. And there was an excellent science teacher there. Uh, had, he just had all the great science toys. He had a Jacob's Ladder. He had a, and I told you about the Jacob's Ladder I made ultimately. His one was a little one, you know, but I, I, anyway, he had a Van de Graaff generator, which is, you know, it, it makes sparks too, you know. And uh, he had, uh, a Tesla coil. He had a uh, he had a cloud chamber where you could actually see radioactive particles shooting through from a a, a, a hunk of uranium ore. He had and uh, and uh, just and and at one point he had a um, a contest between the the girls and the boys as to who could wire up a lamp fastest. And uh, I represented the boys and uh, and uh, they had a gal here. And I had my uh, razor blade to strip the wires with, uh, you know, with uh, my razor. And, uh, and sometimes I'd cut my finger open doing it. Anyway, anyway and, but she had the right tools. She had the thing wired up in no time, and I was still screwing it. And the class was rooting for me. They were, anyway, she beat me hands down. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, uh, I thought he was, you know, he, he really did stimulate my interest in science, you know, uh, he had, because of the, he just had all those great science toys, and, and he, t he taught very well, and it just got that excitement, that fundamental excitement going. And uh, I was already interested in science, but this really confirmed, you know, that this is, this is what I wanted to do. And uh, anyway, um, I was back in Berkeley uh, in... Uh, early 2000 time frame. And uh, I was visiting my cousin Dirk, uh, who lived there, and uh, his significant other, Patricia, was there at the time. He ultimately married her, but she's passed away since then. But uh, anyway, I was telling uh, Dirk about this science class, and Patricia said, oh yeah, I went to Garfield at that time too. And it's since been tr changed to Martin Luther King uh, at junior high. Anyway, uh, the... Uh, I said, oh, well, do you, do you don't know that science teacher? That Did you ever go to that? Oh, yeah, he was, he was hitting on me last week uh, in Berkeley here, you know? Oh, he's still around? Yeah, wow. So I, I dial 411, and uh, she knew his name, and I, I, so I, I dial 411, and I got him on the phone and said, well, you know, thank you for, you know, being such a good science teacher. Well, you know, he was really appreciative, you know, and he said he remembered me, you know, and I got the impression that maybe I was the only student who ever called him up to say thank you. And, you know, and I, which was a, an awful shame, you know, and it really in, informed me, you know, of just how important it is to give positive feedback. It costs you nothing. And, uh, and you know, it, it just, you know, and anyway, I just made it, a, you know, my, you know, uh, an important thing to say thank you, you know, when I, whenever I got, have the opportunity. I wish I'd called up Charles Barnes, too, you know, to say thank you to him for telling me about the non-existence of helium, too, you know, as being a, an essential ingredient to our reality and stuff like that, you know. But anyway, that, uh, that guy was just, you know, a real important person to me. And, and so mentors are very important. And and it also informed me of the fact that some of the most important things you do with your life 
you actually never get that positive feedback on. And you just have to do the right thing and know that you're doing the right thing. Just have the maturity to give yourself that positive feedback and pat yourself on the back, whatever it takes to, to do it, you know, because a lot of the time you just don't get it back, you know, the way you should. Because in mass society, you know, people go their separate ways and they, and I, I've, to, I've told this story to people and they've said, yeah, I wish I'd pho phoned that back. And I've even thought that I've, I'd like to call this guy back, but I never, you know, I've lost track of him, you know, and that's the problem with mass society. You don't, you don't have that opportunity to uh, get back to them, you know. And I just happened to, you know, run into Patricia and she knew the guy's name and I was able to get back to him. You know? Terrific. You Terrific know? story. Yes. You know. We should all do more of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, and that's why I tell this story because just to encourage people to, it doesn't cost you a thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs>